Broadcasting from Manhattan Beach and the World Wide Web, you're listening to CHSR, HealthyLife.net. As a service to our listeners, this program is for general information and entertainment purposes only. CHSR, HealthyLife.net does not recommend, endorse, or object to the views, products, or topics expressed or discussed by show hosts or their guests. We suggest you always consult with your own personal, medical, financial, or legal advisor. Hey there, and welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. This is a place of inspiration, education, and hope for a kinder, healthier, and more sustainable world. On this show, we join together in community to uplift each other and explore new ways that we can care about each other, um, ourselves, and the planet as well. Today's very special program is made possible because of the generous support of our show sponsor, New Roots Herbal, the makers of Acidophilus Ultra, and as many of you know, one of my all-time favorites in the in the culinary area, uh, something called stevia sugar. If you've never tried it, this is this is the time. Um, if you would also like to support the vision of this show by making a donation, or would like to be an advertiser or sponsor to let my 331 or so thousand monthly listeners know about your products or services, just contact me through TeresaNicasio.com website, uh, and that's Teresa with an H, T-H-E-R-E-S-A, N like Nancy, I-C-A-S-S-I-O, so T-H-E-R-E-S-A-N-I-C-A-S-S-I-O.com website. Uh, be sure to join us next time when Dr. Jill Carnahan will be returning to talk about mood disorders. Um, from a functional medicine perspective, if you haven't personally ever suffered from anxiety or depression, most likely others in your life have. Uh, it's pretty universal. Uh, if you visit um, uh, Jill's page on the TeresaNicasio.com website, you'll find links to four of Dr. Jill's articles about mood disorders to get a start on the reading about it, uh, as well as more information about Jill, um, some of her YouTube, um, and information about her past and upcoming appearances on the show. Dr. Jill, and uh, many of you already know Jill, uh, she is amazing and has incredibly empowering information to share. Uh, for today, you know, I was thinking about today's a really big day, and if you're just stumbling onto the show and don't know who we have coming on, uh, you are in for a really big treat. You know, every day is, is you know, every day is a, is a gift, and every moment is a gift, but I was thinking about how today is really a treasure, and um, who we have today coming on, Dr. Uh, Irvin Yalom, he is one of the most uh, influential people who's touched my life. Uh, I'm, I'm a Ripley. Uh, you'll hear more about that today, too, um, um, the ripple effects of, of this incredible human being. Um, uh, it's, it's pretty profound. He's one of the most gracious and open-hearted people you could ever meet, uh, making the impact that he's had on our wonderful field of psychotherapy um, and about the human experience even more. Staggering. Um, I'd like to give a little bit of a formal introduction to, uh, on paper. Uh, Irv is most mostly known as a world-renowned existential psychiatrist, Stanford professor, group psychotherapy proponent, and award-winning author, amongst many things, um, with his innovative writings bridging the fields of psychology, literature, philosophy, and medicine. For me, however, it's Irv's down-to-earth humanity humility and humanization of our profession, that is what has touched me personally and professionally most. In fact, uh, 30 years ago, my um, very dear friend, uh, Dr. Rani Raute, um, we were studying in graduate school, and she gave me uh, Yalom's, one of Yalom's books called Love's Executioner. We were just there at, at Ohio State. And she just said, oh, my God, you're going to love this book. It's just, and she just held it to her heart, and then she gave it to me. Um, and when she gave that book to me, I really didn't have any idea how important and how comforting um, that gift would turn out to be. And even as I say it, I'm, I'm starting to well up a little bit with tears. Um, reading his heartfelt compilation of stories, really um, with his work with his patients, it, it confirmed for me that becoming a psychologist was really indeed my true calling. 
That said, um, I just have to say that uh, you know he talks about rippling in in, um, in his book that he's just released called Becoming Myself. If you don't have it, run as fast as you can. Don't walk uh, and pick up that book or just uh, call it in or, or order it online somehow. You got to get this book in your hand. It's um, it's going to touch you in more ways than you realize. I really can't rave enough about it. Um, anyway, we're going to be talking more about the book today, but it really is, you would never think, or at least I never thought, uh, that a memoir could be such a riveting page turner um, in, in terms of uh, moving through the pages, but you just feel like you're walking beside Irv. Um, he's uh, sharing his musings about life, his musings about about psychotherapy, and Really throughout it, I feel like these whisperings from a soul level of, of uh, gratitude and empathy that, that uh, just goes on and on. Anyway, um, your herb is now 86 years old. He's reflecting on life a great deal and his work. And um, I could just go on and on, Irv, about, about um, you and all the beautiful work you've done. But I'd like to just... Um, just jump in because um, I want to thank, for, thank you for writing this book um, as well as all the other many gifts you've given us, including your willingness to join us today. Thanks for being here. Oh, you're very welcome. Glad to be here. Yeah. Glad to get the word out. Yeah, and uh, what a word. Uh, what a few words in it. Um, you know, from the, in the spirit of, of uh, uh, kind of immediacy, I'm wondering what it's like, even as we're starting this interview today, to talk about um, that you, you know the fact that you wrote a memoir, and that's a, the decision to write a memoir is a pretty big decision. What was that like for you, and how did you how did you come to that decision to write a memoir, and what was that process like, Irv? Well, somehow I've always had I haven't known what the, what the books were about, but I've always felt that I had a stack of books in my mind. Uh, and I was going to do one, and then as soon as I did that one, another one popped into my mind. And I've really gone from one book to the other for the last 20 years or so. And uh, always at the end, I knew there would be a book about my life. And, and um, so I, I knew that I was going to do that, and um, uh, but I didn't know when. And then after I wrote my, my, my last book, it, it just I suddenly started to get to work on it. I... I started one day. I heard my daughter speaking, and she was just talking about reading a book by a by, by, a, by a biologist who was just taking a square yard of his lawn and just going to just look at everything in that square yard and write the whole book about the whole realm of, of biology from using that square yard of the lawn. And I suddenly thought, <clears throat> I wonder if I couldn't do that with a day of my life. You know, I could see my patients, and then they, I would reflect upon that, and then I would reflect upon <clears throat> aspects of my youth and my childhood that they they, they elicited. <clears throat> and that was the model that I had. It didn't last very long. It lasted the first third of the book. Mm-hmm. As, I, as I talked about people that I had seen in my practice and then uh, memories that brought up. But when I got to my late adolescence and started my education in college, I, I went back into a more formal uh, autobiographical mode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it really, it, I love how, how you started, you know, starting the book. You know, so many people ask, you know, what's it like being a, a psychotherapist? You know, what's it like? And you, you capture it so well that you start the book. Um, you started the book with that story. Um, I forget what uh, what the name of the uh, the the person. What was her name? Um, oh, I think the, her the, name was the Alice. Dream. Alice. Pardon? Alice, I think. Yes, the story of Alice. So you had a dream about Alice, and um, so in your, you know, as you enter this book, it's almost like entering into a novel because you start right in the middle of a dream. Um, and can you talk a little bit how you decided to start with? That story, because it, um, you know, you talk about it being connected with empathy. Um, share a little bit about your thoughts with that. Well, it's hard to think about a decision. It just popped in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been reading a book by Stephen Pinker, uh, uh, and he was he was just talking about the the beginnings of empathy, and uh, and then I and then I thought of. That I used to buy school when I was a, a child, adolescent, by swimming by a, a girl's house, and I would call up to her, hi, measles, 
because she mm-hmm. had red spots on her face and um, obviously a severe case of acne. Now, I was too young and uh, thoughtless, really, to, to think that that might not hurt. That might hurt her feelings. It just didn't occur to me. I was just trying to start a relationship. So the, the dream is, well, what would happen if her father were there and heard me saying that and get out and stop my bicycle and talk to me and try to let me know what, what I was doing to his daughter. So the dream was a kind of a bit nightmarish, but it was a very strong dream that I had had. Mm-hmm. And that, that resonance with uh, you know, one of the things you talk a lot about is, is doing everything we can to live a, a regretful life. Uh, but there's things that we do, as you're saying, you had no idea. You were just trying to build a relationship, like you said, trying to connect. Right. Um, yeah, go ahead. But, but it, it just didn't dawn on me to think about the impact of my words on other people. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that, that's what... Um, Pinker was doing that now. He said, well, you know, and, and civilization didn't do that until perhaps, uh, you know, there were, the first novels came out in, in England then 300 years ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there were epistolary novels, uh, one person writing a letter to the other and to the other. But it was the first time we really got, got into the subjectivity of, of other people and mm-hmm. began to develop empathy for them. And that was, that was so for me. And that was mm-hmm. where a lot of childhood experiences that I had, they were so unthinking, and I didn't have any real uh, mentors or parental guidance. Uh, mm-hmm. when my parents worked at a, their little grocery store, worked uh, 12, 13 hours a day. So I was on my own much of my childhood. Yeah, and and uh, and as you were talking about, like those first 14 years of your life being... You know, in living in the home, just the, the flat just above the uh, a store with, you know, I'm also kind of a roach phobe. <laughs> um, but uh, it's like they just freak me out. But, you know, your, your home being totally uh, infested with roaches and, and um, you know, rats and roaches and, and the crime and the anti-Semitism, that, that uh, what, a, what a hard place to start. Yep, that, that was my beginning, and incidentally, that's one of the great advantages that nobody ever talks about of living in California. I have not seen a roach in 50 years. It's too dry for them. Yeah, well, I, well that's too dry. <laughs> it's too dry. There are no roaches here. And well, the right, you, right species of living here in California. Yes, well, you, you would think so. You would think so, Irv, but uh, I went to school at USC, and they had roaches there. <laughs> and they really? Had that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, there, but we don't want to get diverted onto well, roaches. Not, but, not in Palo Alto or around Stanford. Maybe it's even drier here. Yeah, or at least a different, yeah, whatever reason it was, um, but I did, I chuckled when, when you said advantage of California. I says, oh man, but they're, they're there too. Um, <laughs> yeah, quite, quite interesting. But, um, but you know, in that, in this, there's, you're talking about the advantages. Um, what, I, I think that, you know, when we, when we experience life and hardship, um, as therapists, that there's, as hard as it is, and maybe there's things we wouldn't wish on anyone, um, can you talk a little bit about what you see as some of the advantages of that? Because, you know, and, and we'll get into self-disclosure, but what, you know, the value of, of hardship, whether it's your first 14 years or whether it's now as you're um, discovering, you know, kind of memory loss or other of the of the real impacts of, of aging or whatever it is, what, what do you see as some of the benefits as a therapist as well as a human being? Well, I'm not sure I've got a good answer to that. I, I have a hard time thinking about the value of early life hardships. Um, right now I see it pretty much of a disadvantage straight through. And more and more I'm, I'm aware of myself as I wrote my own memoir, but also with my patients. Uh, and I have a I gave a talk recently at, at this large convention in Anaheim where I had a patient, and it's really clear that, that he's got some, some some bad memories really left over, but but from early life, so early that it was pre-verbal, and they're kind mm-hmm. of feeling memories, and feelings, feelings come up, and there's no, there's no uh, words attached to them of things that happened in the, in the first two, three, four years of life. 
I think that mm. for, for me too. Those are our scars early on. Uh, maybe they may be more empathic to other people who were having those things. You have a certain advantage. That's that's possibly one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, yeah. my childhood it was very solitary. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, lived alone, and, and, and lived in the world of books. Because mm -hmm. I visited the library every week. Yeah, and those books—it's uh, you know—my my heart was aching as you were um, talking about life and and, your, and uh, the lack of relationship with your dad and um, and the the harshness of your mom, um, and 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 part of the ache that I. I Noticed myself as I was reading your book was how there's pieces of it that still linger of the ache, um, especially with your mom. You want to talk a little bit about your about that and um, and some of your thoughts and reflections because they're so deep and, and and rich. Right. Well, my mother was a very very difficult character, very strong. Um, she worked side by side with my father. <laughs> she had no education. I mean, virtually zero. Uh, neither did my father, but they immigrated from Russia uh, in their, uh, when they were about 20 and uh, had to work to survive and work very hard to survive and uh, support their parents as well. Um, and so they were, they were very uneducated uh, people. Um, they only knew that they wanted something for me, something better. Um, and so they worked hard. Mm -hmm. able to support me, get me, support me through medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, not much joy in in their lives, except okay. for a uh, family. Every Sunday, the entire family, all, all of them, maybe 20, they emigrated from this small little village called the Shtetl in, in, in Russia, would get together and, and spend spend much of Sundays together. That was that was pleasant. Um, mm -hmm. and I have cousins I still know very closely from, from those days. Mm -hmm. it, it was a hard life, uninformed, although not not in this world, not, not in the United States. There was there was very little immigration, or very little integration, I should say, uh, in, into this this culture and this society. But yeah. they were eager for their children to do it. At the same time, knowing maybe at some level, that the more their children do it, the more the more their children would separate and distance themselves from them. Mm -hmm. um, so they wanted me to get an education, but they knew that that education would take me further and further from them. So it's a bittersweet. Yeah, and, and you know, you mentioned about how they, um, you know, that they probably would never be able to even understand your books, and yet your mom in her old age would keep the pile of books and smell, just hold and smell the books. That was yeah, they wouldn't, they couldn't understand them, uh, and, and my mother really oh, was near blind uh, towards the end of her life, so so they could just. She just had a pile of them, would stroke them and uh, show them to all the visitors that came by. Uh, mm -hmm. she, was, she was proud of them, but she she really didn't understand what I was really writing about. Mm -hmm. And you know, in a way, she never really understood you. No, I don't think so. Yeah, uh, yeah. She, she couldn't understand quite what I was going through. Her, her past had been so very different. There was nothing she could take from her own life and try to use that to help her understand what I was going through. And I, I became uh, distant and secretive from her. Uh, mm -hmm. She knew I was dating some girl when I was about 15, and she didn't like this girl very much since this girl was Oh, she didn't like Marilyn? No, she, she Marilyn was very short. Now, my uh -huh. mother was extremely short, and uh -huh. probably even a little shorter than Marilyn, but never recognized, never recognized that. <laughs> yeah, but, so uh, I want to go somewhat ahead. Somewhat jealous, I think, of Marilyn, and uh, um, so, but, uh, but she, she, she's come to really admire and respect Marilyn. Everyone, everyone mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's so that's so sweet. Yeah, and I want uh, you know as we get a little later, we don't have a lot more time before the break, but to hear more about you know your relationship with Marilyn, which is it's uh, it's it's really kind of um, a miracle. Uh, you know, we think about Bowlby and attachment theory, and um, that you were able to create such a beautiful attachment with um, with someone with having such um, challenged uh, attachments uh, in those early days. Yeah, well, I've clung, clung to her and made other attachments in my life, too, people who 
I've had lifelong friendships with. Uh, mm, yeah. Part of my teens, and who have all died. I, I'm becoming an expert now in what the, what you go through in your 80s. Maybe I'll write about that someday. But, you know, you see your friends die one by one, and you're suddenly living in a, in a new world, a world with all these people that you could share your, your youth with and talk about things that you all have gone through over the decades. And that, that is very hard when your good friends die. Yeah, and you talked about that at the because uh, 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 um, Irvin I met uh, just briefly me amongst a gazillion other people uh, met Irv, um, but yeah, it uh, his address at your keynote address he spoke a bit about that and it was it really um, was was quite moving um, you know talking about that so maybe we'll talk after the break we'll um, be coming back with um, Dr. Irv Yalom he's such a special guy um, and and yeah let's let's carry on talking a little bit about uh, maybe talking about memories um, and remembering and um, this that process when we return after the break so don't go away we'll be right back Acidophilus Ultra from New Roots Herbal is your go-to product for great health. To maintain potency, Acidophilus Ultra is protected by a natural water-based enteric coating. This daily probiotic supports your health in so many ways. It helps boost your immune system, aids digestion and bloating, and that's just for starters. So remember the name, Acidophilus Ultra from New Roots Herbal. Get some now. To find a store near you, visit NewRootsHerbal.com. That's NewRootsHerbal.com. For all your live or pre-recorded webcasting needs, come to EarthChannel.com. Get your web-based message out to a select group or the whole world. It's easy. A pioneer in webcasting, EarthChannel.com provides the best products and services to big corporations and government users. And now, this same technology is available to you. They have the best EarthCast encoders, servers, and products to meet your technical needs. But wait, don't want to mess with technical stress? No problem. They'll do it for you. EarthChannel.com is your answer. You can use webcasting for lots of things like advertising, marketing, customer support, training, and don't forget, web radio and TV. In fact, you're listening to a live EarthCast right now. So come to EarthChannel.com. Actualize your audio or video webcasting needs today. You can't beat the friendly service or the price. Call EarthChannel.com at 1-800-849-8978. That's 1-800-849-8978. YumFoodForLiving.com is the place to get easy, allergy-free recipes, all free of sugar, gluten, and dairy. But that's not all you'll get when you visit YumFoodForLiving.com. You'll get resources for all kinds of things like wellness articles, videos, podcasts, a blog, all to help you create easy, healthy living. There's even a 50-page downloadable book introducing you to the philosophy of yum. Don't wait. Visit yumfoodforliving.com. Yumfoodforliving.com. That's yumfoodforliving.com. If you like to spend your television viewing time learning about some of the things that you may have missed in history class, or if history was your favorite subject, then you should check out the link to the History Channel on the HealthyLife.net advertiser page. Order DVD sets by series or by subject matter right from our homepage while you still enjoy your favorite HealthyLife.net show. You're listening to HealthyLife.net, the radio network that brings positive talk with positive change to make your world a little better. Welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. For those of you who are just joining us, on today's show we're talking with probably one of the most influential and innovative psychotherapists of our time, of our lifetime, um, Dr. Irvin Yalom. Um, we were, uh, just before the break, we just started to touch upon this idea of memories and remembering and um, being the keepers of, of memories. Uh, so, Irv, you know, we, we, at the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference that we were just at in, um, gosh, I guess it was December, you shared some stories about what that's like. You know, having, as you were just mentioning before the break, um, you know, having friends and, and memories and, and one by one losing them. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? 
Well, I think one of the things I, I was thinking about then and talked about then it was that I've, had, I've, I've suffered a loss of, a, of three really close friends last year, and then my sister as well. I have only one sister. But those, those three friends were my cadaver mates. It's a little gruesome, I know, but <laughs> the four of us dissected, uh, dissected a cadaver in medical school. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so I found them all the way back then, and, and these are people I would. Well, there were two of them lived in other parts of the country, but we'd speak on the phone every week or twice a week. <coughs> and so they were they were gone, and and I uh, was uh, was quite mournful about that and thinking about that. Yeah. But then also I, I I had a couple of patients coming in, and, and they were talking about things that touched off some memories about that, and I told them about those those losses um, and and the story brought up the whole issue for me which has always been an important issue of my therapy with patients is how much does a therapist tell about his own self and his own life and I'm mm-hmm. way over on one end of the continuum in that way I, I tend to be much more of a real person and share a good mm-hmm. part of my life and I give some examples with two different patients how I shared about losing these friends and they were quite meaningful to the patients to hear that I think it helped the course of therapy. Mm-hmm. Well you say of course um, of course it's meaningful in therapy um, but that's not that's not necessarily shared and, and you've experienced therapies um, where there wasn't much shared that that old you know when I think about the blank slate uh, ideas of some of the original yeah. therapies and it, it kind of makes me shiver because I think about the um, the still face experiments and how it's like a great example of that. The, the what experiments? The, the still face exper- oh, yeah. uh, experiments where they right, have right. the babies. Yeah. Sure. And how they, uh, for those of you who are just listening, the still face experiments are when they um, they have like mommy, you know, like usually there's a mom and, and a baby interacting right. and, and responding to each other. And then they would see what would happen to the baby when the mother would just have a blank flat face and not share in that engagement and not interact and um, how it really was disruptive and uh, to mm-hmm. the to the baby and the baby would start to scream and cry and try to get engagement. Sure. And I was and and so I think about how the early psychotherapists talk about us being a blank slate and that never made sense to me. Well, it was a wrong steer. Freud was a, a progenitor of our field. And before Freud, there was no psychotherapy. And he, he didn't just invent psychoanalysis. He invented the whole field of psychotherapy. But as a wrong steer, this idea that the therapist shows nothing of himself is a blank screen. He had a reason for doing it. I mean, Freud's mm-hmm. reason was, I don't know if people appreciate this, he thought that, that, that if the therapist remained a blank slate, that the, the, the patients would kind of put their own feelings about their parents and everything into the therapist, and they would be transferred. You transfer feelings onto this blank screen. Well, th- yes, that may be true. That, that it's possible, but it's 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 not important enough to uh, hold back the idea of relating to the person as a genuine human being. Uh, mm-hmm. So I feel that the genuineness and really relating to people is the important issue. And we've done that in this country ever since Carl Rogers, who was an important psychologist mm-hmm. about 70 years ago, uh, really came up with with this, this idea. So I feel like, uh, you know, I I, didn't, I never like to put a patient on a couch and sit behind him so he can't see me. That, that's a traditional orthodox psychoanalytic mode. I don't think it's a good I don't think it's a good approach to therapy. Yeah, yeah, and and you know I loved how when you were talking about because you've experienced all these different forms of therapy, how uh, what that was like, but how the things that really stood out for you were when the therapist was present and um, you know uh, just where their their, their hum- humanity uh, came forward. And yeah, uh, that was yeah. really what was healing. I always took advantage of some bad spell in my life where I was anxious or down and I got myself into therapy, but with a different form of therapy. So I, I got a good sample personally of what it was like to undergo each of these forms of therapy. And I feel that and the I love you. is paramount. Yeah, excuse me, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, I was talking over you. Um, yeah, it was, so it was paramount. Go ahead. No, that's that's uh, that's so. I, I mean, that's what I really treasure uh, mm-hmm. about the, the therapist and the patient having this genuine relationship. Mm-hmm. 
so in, on that on that front of all the therapists that you worked with, uh, one of my absolute favorites, uh, Dr. Rolla May, uh, and a lot of you who know me have, have, have been uh, the courage to create is one for me was one of the most um, moving and uh, transformative books too. Um, I know how much I love him. Uh, talk a little bit about share a little bit about your experience with Rolla May and how his work with you um, affected your how you. Well, your own therapy, but also um, your appreciation for for the self disclosure or the connection or relationship and mentoring of therapy. Well, Rollo was very important to me <clears throat> through his books. First of all, when I was a resident, I was at Johns Hopkins in my second year of psychiatric residency. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of traditional psychoanalytic mode and. Uh, talking about uh, the whole field of psychiatry started in the 19th century when uh, Pinnell was getting the <clears throat> patients out of these prison hospitals and back into the community. Um, but, then, uh, but, but I had a feeling that therapy went back much longer than that because all the great philosophers dealt with uh, issues that are very important to us. And Rollo May came out at that point with a book called Existence. Um, and I read that, and I immediately began to see, I've got to learn something about this field, this world of philosophy. And, I, and as a psych, psychiatric resident, meaning I'd already finished medical school and was trained to be a psychiatrist, I decided to go back to college and went over to the Johns Hopkins undergraduate and enrolled in, in philosophy courses. So I began to get a philosophy education because I think the wisdom of the elders of, of, of Plato and Aristotle, maybe especially Euripides, had a lot of implications for our field. And much later on, after I cleared off a lot of other books that I wanted to write on group therapy and a couple of novels, I decided I'd write a book about existential psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. But to write that book, I knew the greater part of that book would have to deal with death, which is an existential terror that, that is in front of all of us. And mm -hmm. I started working for a long time with patients who were dying of cancer. And I got so anxious that I had to go back into therapy. And I learned that Rollo May had just moved to California. So I started seeing him in therapy so for at least two years. And uh, I grew very close to him. And afterwards, we became close friends. That's very rare and uh, not advisable, but it just it worked out that way. Yeah, and, and you know, it was a different time in terms of even our thoughts about all of that, but it ended up being rich. And how ironic that um, the, you know that you were the, the death anxiety is, is a big part of what brought you to him, and you were Absolutely. at his bedside when he died. Yeah, and I I did some healing for him when he was dying. Wow. Yeah. It's, and, and also your um, the other, um, which I know we need to go to break here in a moment, but but that other mentor from um, from your residency. From John Whitehorn, yeah, was that was another one whose whose death I attended too. Yeah. So as I was reading your book, and those, um, you know, I just the, the tears just were flowing, and the the the, the, the rawness, the the realness, and, and all of that. So um, yeah. So maybe after break, we can talk about um, uh, a little bit more about about uh, we can uh, ongoing about death and dying and and, sure. and all of that. But uh, but also, I'd love to have you talk a little bit about love and as love's executioner um, and and yet one of the a great champion of love yourself. It would be wonderful if we can um, talk about Marilyn after the break. Right. All right. So don't go away, folks. We'll be right back with Irvin. There's a book that makes it so easy to embrace a healthy, gluten-free lifestyle. Even kids will like it. Filled with heartwarming stories, food as medicine health tips, easy allergy-free recipes, and creative culinary inventions, the award-winning book Yum! by Dr. Teresa Nicasio is your source for all of this and more. So make gluten-free living easy, tasty, and fun. Get Yum! plant-based recipes for a gluten-free diet at Amazon.com or visit yumfoodforliving.com. That's yumfoodforliving.com. 
What does HealthyLife.net and Amazon.com have in common? Well, they're both available on the Internet. They both give great value. But most important, most of our positive program hosts and guests are accomplished authors. And their books are available from, you got it, Amazon.com. Now it even gets better than that. Because when you're listening on air to a HealthyLife.net host or guest, you can go directly to Amazon.com and you can order your book while you're still listening to your favorite HealthyLife.net program. So when you hear an author you like, go to the homepage of HealthyLife.net and click on Amazon.com. When you have a food allergy or dietary limitation, Dr. Teresa Nicasio knows it's hard to give up the foods you love, so she decided to put on her chef hat and give you affordable, personalized culinary consultations that will light up your taste buds. You'll explore or substitute ingredients so you can enjoy your favorite foods again. She'll even help you make food preparation easy and guide you on your path to healthy living. And to get started, all you have to do is call 604-445-6463. That's 604-445-6463. HealthyLife.net, the positive radio network. YumFoodForLiving.com is the place to get easy, allergy-free recipes, all free of sugar, gluten, and dairy. But that's not all you'll get when you visit YumFoodForLiving.com. You'll get resources for all kinds of things like wellness articles, videos, podcasts, a blog, all to help you create easy, healthy living. There's even a 50-page downloadable book introducing you to the philosophy of yum. Don't wait. Visit YumFoodForLiving.com. Yumfoodforliving.com. That's yumfoodforliving.com. HealthyLife.net, the positive radio network. Welcome back to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. Uh, today we're talking really from the heart with um, um, one of my most dear um, existential psychotherapists on the planet, uh, Dr. Irvin Yalom, um, about life and death and kind of everything in, in between that, in between both. Um, and before the break, we were talking a little bit about uh, existential psychotherapy, Rollo May, and, um, and just touched upon a little bit about how the early philosophers and and authors uh, of literature um, were really some of the earliest psychologists, and and so it would be. I'd, I'd love it if you could talk, Irvin, a little bit more about that and how you um, transitioned from being, um, you know, more in that regular conventional psych, psych, psychiatric world and doing um, a more technical sort of psychiatry and shifted into into a more narrative approach. So let's just start there. Okay. <laughs> well, I. For, for me to, to write a book about an existential approach to therapy, it seemed that there was so much <clears throat> of the existential issues. For example, <clears throat> uh, meaning of life. For example, uh, 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 the obvious one, death. The uh, whole question of, 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 of freedom, the whole question of isolation, how the idea to which we create our own world, uh, how we make these decisions, how hard decisions are for so many people. So all these issues uh, I, I want to write about, but the main one that I had to learn about was about death. And as, as I said just a couple minutes ago, I just started to see patients, uh, because my, I couldn't talk about death with my regular patients. I didn't really know how to do that. Nobody did that. So I decided to work with people who had to talk about dying because they were dying, they had cancer, they were being treated with chemotherapy, uh, and uh, they were very, very isolated. At that time, and perhaps still today, people <clears throat> who deal with cancer may be doubly isolated because <clears throat> they isolate themselves. They don't want to bring down their family. <clears throat> Uh, they don't want to bring down their friends and talk about these macabre things that are troubling them. And also, mm-hmm. other people don't know how to talk to them. They don't want to upset them. So they don't want to upset their families. Other people don't want to upset them. They're very isolated. So I decided to start doing groups. Mm-hmm. Everyone in was dealing with cancer. And I did that for about 10 years. And, and during that point, I just began to get the feeling more and more that... <clears throat> Foster has been talking about this for centuries, long before psychiatry came on into the field. Um, mm-hmm. I'm especially interested in somebody named Euripides, who was an ancient Greek philosopher, and he had a school where people would learn various arguments that would help them deal with the fear of death. <coughs> and one of them was the, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, one of them was the argument that um, 
you know, the symmetry argument that you will be, after, after death, you will be in the same state, the same non-state, if you will, that you were in before you were born. Nobody's very anxious about that state before you were born, but yet it's absolutely equivalent to the state. <laughs> So, yeah. I, I love that argument. The, the philosophers have been debating that and disagreeing with that for centuries and centuries or centuries, but it certainly served me in good stead and, and a lot of my patients. So there's so much to be drawn from, from early thinkers of, about our field, and I tried to do that in that textbook on existential therapy. Um, mm -hmm. That was a, a really the second major textbook I wrote. That first one that took me some years was on group therapy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I love how when you were talking about the, uh, writing that book, how you started out with it was so stilted, or just the talking about the you know, choosing the group, you know, the group composition and and, and the ins and outs. But then how um, you got uh, it, you you were you got your tenure early um, unexpectedly, and how it freed you to have a different voice. Oh, book. right, the group therapy textbook. I, I was got tenure unexpectedly a year earlier than I than I thought I would. And, I was writing, I'd written the first couple of chapters of the book, and after that I started to write in an entirely different way, not for these very severe-looking people who I imagine on my tenure committee at, at Stanford, but, but for the readers. And, and so mm -hmm. the rest of the book reads beautifully, but those two chapters, even after it's gone through five editions, still stick out like a sore thumb. They're so dull and mm -hmm. so researchy. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to do another edition of that book this year with my colleague, and those two chapters are definitely going to have to go this time. Oh, it's so, I'm so excited to see where you go with that. Yeah. But but that idea of shifting more into the narrative, into the storytelling, um, it, it's it, it's really wonderful. Not just in your in your uh, the novels that you ended up uh, moving towards writing, but you even did that in your textbooks, where you were able to. And, and, and in your case, even in your case consultations, when you, you, you rewrote how you, um, how, how psychiatry was done, you, you, you went out of the box and um, have been taking it in so many different ways. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and how you ended up going into writing novels? Yeah, well, I, I love writing. In fact, in another era, another generation, I, I, I might have been a writer. It was something that interested me from early life, or from writing and reading. But, <clears throat> but once I started medical school and became a physician, gradually that other impulse, that writerly impulse, came out. The reason my group therapy textbook has been very successful on a state all these years is because there's I bootlegged a lot of short stories in there. I mean, stories. <laughs> long or maybe a page or two long and I've heard a lot of readers tell me they're willing to put up with a lot of dull theory because there might be an interesting story coming around the corner as mm -hmm. I talk about things that actually happened in the group mm -hmm. and then later after I I got uh, older and finished the, that existential therapy textbook I decided I'm going to write a book of stories just stories and mm -hmm. I wrote a book called Love of Execution which is 10 mm -hmm. stories of psychotherapy yeah um, and Brilliant I, book. I, Brilliant yeah. book. Thank you. I wrote that book. I wrote ten stories, and then I wrote a sixty-page afterward explaining exactly what I was teaching in each of these stories. <laughs> uh, then I encountered the editor from my publisher from Basic Books, who uh, who said, "You can't write. You can't tell them what you're going to put in these stories. That that afterward has to go." And I battled with her for about a year, and finally we got it down to about eight pages, and it became an introduction on it afterward. And she was an editor from hell, you know, but also <laughs> an editor from heaven as well, because she really taught me let the story do the teaching. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I, if I wanted to teach anything, I had to figure out a way to do it in the story itself. And I've done mm -hmm. that in several books of stories and in, in novels as well. It was a, it was a mm -hmm. great turning point for me in my life. Yeah. And, and in, you know, in this, in the process, I, I, I really appreciate in the stories that, that you talk about the things that, that truly do matter and, and, you know, whether it's death, whether it's, you know, the, the heartaches, whether it's around the struggles around isolation and freedom and, and, um, you know, the, it's 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 kind of amazing that the field of psychiatry wasn't talking about a lot of those things about death in particular. It's sort of been the elephant in the in the living room. But you brought it. You brought. 
you know, you brought it right to the surface. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I did. I did do that, and of mm-hmm. course, I paid a price for it with a, a lot of personal anxiety about that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but um, which is you know more or less over with a bit now. But this is coming back again as I get to be eighty-six. And uh, and I'm kind of interested in looking at the psychology of being as old as I am, mm-hmm. <laughs> being the last leaf on the tree. It's it's yeah. it's, it's, it's quite interesting. I, uh, if I ever write anything, it'll be what it's like being this age. Yeah. Well, and you know, I think sure it would be amazing to have a whole piece on that. But I I have to say that that the the again the whisperings of that are um, are really part of the tapestry of this book. I I felt like. Um, uh, you know my, you know some of my own loved ones who are um, in their 80s, or my uncle who just died, uh, you know, about three months ago, um, right. and um, how I wish he could have had this book because I felt like it would have been brought a lot of smiles and tears and comfort and reflections. Um, and so, I, you know, don't don't underestimate. I feel like this this book is is you know capturing some of that. But we do have to go to um, one more break. I I can't believe how fast the time flies. But um, when we come back, let's talk a little bit about love and um, and uh, and a little bit more about about your book. Okay. So stick around, folks. We'll be right back. Acidophilus Ultra from New Roots Herbal is your go-to product for great health. To maintain potency, Acidophilus Ultra is protected by a natural water-based enteric coating. This daily probiotic supports your health in so many ways. It helps boost your immune system, aids digestion and bloating, and that's just for starters. So remember the name, Acidophilus Ultra from New Roots Herbal. Get some now. To find a store near you, visit NewRootsHerbal.com. That's NewRootsHerbal.com If you're like the 8 out of 10 women that say finding genes that fit is a problem, well, your problem is solved. Lee Genes has done extensive research, and they have genes that fit. There's even an online Lee Fit Finder, so you can find the right fit for you. Imagine jeans that instantly slim you with a custom fit and no gap waistband. And guys, kids, Lee has jeans for you, too. Click through to Lee's Jeans on the HealthyLife.net advertiser page and get what fits. When you have a food allergy or dietary limitation, Dr. Teresa Nicasio knows it's hard to give up the foods you love, so she decided to put on her chef hat and give you affordable, personalized culinary consultations that will light up your taste buds. You'll explore substitute ingredients so you can enjoy your favorite foods again. She'll even help you make food preparation easy and guide you on your path to healthy living. And to get started, all you have to do is call 604-445-6463. That's 604-445-6463. There's a book that makes it so easy to embrace a healthy, gluten-free lifestyle, even kids will like it. Filled with heartwarming stories, food as medicine health tips, easy allergy-free recipes, and creative culinary inventions, the award-winning book Yum! by Dr. Teresa Nicasio is your source for all of this and more. So make gluten-free living easy, tasty, and fun. Get Yum! Plant-Based Recipes for a Gluten-Free Diet at Amazon.com or visit YumFoodForLiving.com. That's YumFoodForLiving.com. Radio your way. HealthyLife.net. Welcome back. You're listening to the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. If you're just tuning in, we're here today talking about um, uh, Dr. Irvin Yalom's uh, new memoir called Becoming Myself, which is available. Uh, where's, where's your book available, Irvin? Well, Amazon, every bookstore. Uh, every bookstore. 
pick, pick this book up, guys. Uh, and if you, um, if you, uh, I'm going to do this as well. I'm going to write a review on this book. So if you do get this book, uh, or after you read it, be sure to write a review. Um, uh, your, this book is going to touch you in ways that um, I can't even describe. There's ways that I'm sure I'll continue to be processing um, for some time. It's, uh, it's a book that I also want to give to many people as gifts. I was just telling her during the break how my uncle, who just died three months ago, um, he, uh, I so wish I could have shared this book with him before he died. I know it would have brought him tremendous, tremendous comfort and um, laughs and tears and um, and and feeling less alone. So, now speaking of feeling less alone, um, the uh, we talked about Marilyn. You you met when you were fifteen, and she was fourteen. And um, there's not many people who can say that about about the person they end up. Um, having yes, a, we, are, they have a we, are, we are a rarity in that way. We somehow I, I just knew that, uh, that this was the woman I wanted to spend my life with. It's very very bizarre that I would feel that or think that, but I just did. And I bet my cousin, somebody who's still alive and still very closely, I bet him thirty dollars after my first date with Marilyn that I would marry her, and he paid up <laughs> on my wedding day. So that's so that shows you how how sure I was about that. <laughs> that is so sweet. That was quite a few years after uh, that, that bet of $30, you betting man you. I probably about eight years later. Oh, my gosh. That's so, it's so sweet. So, you know, we you know, talked about, mentioned about isolation, and, um, and, and I mentioned about Bowlby and attachment, and it's such a universal death and, and seeking and longing for connection, um, whether it's in the romantic realm or others, but um, it's such a privilege. And can you talk a little bit about what Marilyn has meant for you um, along this journey? Oh, Marilyn has meant so much uh, to me. Just one thing has been about her fields of study, though. She's she's in literature, and she, she took her Ph.D. from Hopkins in comparative German and French literature, so she began to introduce me to writers like Kafka and Camus, and um, I was reading a lot of people that, that she she was reading as well. So I, I began, I, I, I couldn't become a, a literary writer. I became a doctor instead. But I kept on reading and acquainting myself more and more with this other world. So I do have a, a range of that, and I am always reading. Uh, mm-hmm. I never go to sleep without reading a novel. Just the last uh, two or three weeks, I, I sort of rediscovered Chekhov. I mm. really enjoy Chekhov very much. I just... This one of these writers that appeal to me, and I've started to read him again now, and I can see I'm bowled over by him. He's such a great writer. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. so, so Marilyn has, has been at my side all, all these many years, and, um, and we've had four children, and, um, and she's still around, and she's still healthy as, as I am, so I consider myself extraordinarily uh, fortunate. Mm-hmm. And and you know, thinking about love, if there was if there was you know one thing you were to share with our audience about love, um, from, from that place of wisdom, because you know there's ups and downs, there's good times, there's bad times. You talk about some of those in your book too, and in, in the relationship even. What would you recommend if if there's one little tidbit uh, that you'd give to our audience? Well, my tidbit is to try and make her life as 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 rich as I possibly can. This Mm -hmm. morning, she had to wake up. I had to wake up at 8 o'clock for this show. She had to, Mm -hmm. she has a new book out called The Amorous Heart. And she's on another radio show. She had to be on up at 6 o'clock. It was East Coast show. So I was, (laughs) so I woke up about 6 worried that she's not going to make that show. She was up in another room last night. So I got up to make sure she, she got, she got out of that. So it's caring for the other person. Uh, Yeah. Wanting wanting the other person to be, to be happy. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, she, I went to, Bookstore reading last night, a big bookstore near me called Kepler's, and um, we watched her read. And I felt so proud of her, and um, you know, and I, and I, so I do all all these years. I'm very fortunate. I, I see so many people who've not been able to find a person like that in their life, or lost someone at a very early age. And here we are. I'm 86. Yeah. She's a few months younger than I am, and we're still in pretty good health. So. 
uh, I, I consider myself quite quite blessed by that. Mm-hmm. It is such a blessing. And you know, and I, I share with a lot of people talking about love and focusing on, on love as a verb, you know, it's that service that you're talking about of, of caring about, like awakening and, and your first thought not being what am I going to get from this other person, from this relationship, but, but what can I give? How can I exactly. bring more ease? Yeah, that's, that's very well put. I, I do, and of course, the book that I wrote called the story that I wrote called Love's Execution was the story of romantic love, of, mm-hmm. of love that uh, that doesn't stay. Uh, where you, it's an unreal love. You're not really seeing that person for what they are. You're putting things onto that person that are meaningful to you. Sometimes romantic love, you know, will grow and mature and change into a deeper kind of love. Often it does, does not. Uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, it be the love for people we hardly know, or for movie stars, or, or things like that. Mm-hmm. But but um, but relationships and closeness with other people and intimacy is extremely important to me in my life and my work. I spend a lot of time in group therapy, but what I'm doing in group therapy is I'm look, when I lead groups, and what I'm doing is to try and help people. Look at their relationships, not with outside people in their life, but with the people in the group. They will say, well, I, I'm not going to see this person afterwards. They're not important to me. I'm having a problem with my boss or my wife or whatever. But the truth is that, that if you can work on your relationship with other people face-to-face in the group, they become a kind of microcosm of the problems you're having with people outside. You may be afraid of angry people. Well, that will come up in a group if someone in that group has those features. I, uh, I I look at how you how you form bonds, how you become friends. Uh, having a series of friends, male and female, in my life has been extremely important to me. And that's one of the reasons yeah. I'm distressed now because I lost so many of those close friends. Yeah. Well, that idea of, uh, I love with you know in terms of the group work and the idea that cultivating intimacy um, is is uh, is a skill. And it's a decision. It's a it's a commitment. Um, and therapists have to learn how to do that. Sometimes yeah, they and, have it innately. Because Roger used to say you select therapists, not train them. But you have to have it innately, or you have to really get it in your training to learn how to be close to other people. It's so true. Well, Irv, <clears throat> speaking of closeness, unfortunately, this session today, our talk, is we're having to bring it to a close. But I feel. Um, I feel closer to you. I really appreciate um, this time with you, and I hope all of you listeners have enjoyed this as well. I don't want this picnic again. I love you talk about how it's like ending the picnic. Um, and, but before we end, I do want to acknowledge, I want to thank um, New Roots Herbal for sponsoring this show um, and making it possible uh, for beautiful things um, like Irv to be able to come to the show. And um, any last words real quicker before we close? No, but thank you. You've made this very easy. It's been like a, a, an old chat with an old friend, so it's, uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's been very easy. Yeah, likewise. Okay. I feel the same way. Okay. So, for, so folks, um, I'm Teresa, and this has been the Dr. Teresa Nicasio Show. I hope you've enjoyed it. Until next time, have a great week. Mm-hmm.